welcome to Silicon Valley Mobile Developer Designer Meetup Group. Uh, let me show you the full names. <laughs> so this is to make sure you're in the right place. And uh, this is the last meetup of 2016, so I'm excited to see you guys. This is one of the most important topics we have had this year, open source and uh, also iOS. So just to give you a little bit, little bit about the meetup and myself, so I started this meetup two, almost two and a half years ago. It was a different meetup, I took it over and then I grew it. And since I do a lot of Android development, a little bit iOS, I wanted to combine everything under one roof. And I also do design and prototyping. So I was like, I go to different meetups and learn different technologies, but I would want to bring my friends and people like Wojtek who are experts in their area in different domains and talk about it. And ideally, I would like you to also cross-train yourself so that you're not just Android or iOS or even Windows. You can uh, shift, and uh, but it's your pick. That's up to you. I'm just we're just gonna do uh, meetups on those topics covering design, UX, and development. Next year, going more big, and we're gonna do uh, workshops and events both in the Bay Area and also in San Francisco. So uh, this was, this is the final celebration kind of a 2016 by doing the talk on the theme about community. Since, you know, this is a free meetup and you guys show up, make it possible. This is growing because of you guys, so thanks for that. And uh, with the same respect, open source, the whole community is built by people and it grows, you know, by contributions and uh, building on top of each other's work and then for other people. So that's the theme of tonight. We're gonna switch the agenda a little bit. So I was gonna talk about the big picture of open source, but uh, since Wojtek talks is so awesome, I don't want you to hold it any longer. So we're gonna have him speak first on his iOS app, and I'll go second in the end um, and talk about the open source development <coughs> methodology, software licenses, some of the technicalities, and how can somebody get started? And then I'll talk about a different initiative that we want to do something in 2017. So without further ado, the main speaker for tonight is Wojtek. He is not only an iOS developer, as you may have seen on this YouTube video, he has created a really awesome app called Sensorama, which is about, uh, which is an open source project in itself on GitHub, and uh, it's his own pet project. He is also a full-time engineer at Twin Prime Startup, and I heard him first speak at Silicon Valley Code Camp this year. How many people were there at Code Camp? Okay, a few people. If you guys have not been there, Next year, please go. It's a free two-day conference on a lot of different topics. And I heard him speak on more general on how to get started in open source contribution. And I thought it's a great topic. We gotta have something for mobile developers uh, at our meetup. So here he is today. And uh, he is also a longtime contributor to the FreeBSD project. You can see the sticker here. So you can ask him questions about that. And uh, without further ado, Let's give a big round of applause to uh, Wojtek. All right. Give me a second, I'm going to wire myself in. Yes. Informally, I just want to get an idea, because uh, we've been doing a lot of meetups, mostly focused on Android, because that's been my kind of my main uh, skill and my main uh, network. How many people are iOS developers? Either any stage, beginner, newbie, advanced, expert, intermediate, okay, great, or at least you're interested in it, and how many people right now are contributing some sort in open source uh, within their company or informally? Or, okay, that's great too, because today it's all about open source and so you'll learn about it. And uh, if you're not iOS, what kind of work you do? Can I give some shout outs? Like, what do you do? Uh, what kind of work do you do? Embedded. Embedded? Great. And uh, somebody else, what about yourself? Windows. Windows. Awesome, I forget to mention, we also do Windows Talks, because uh, uh, Microsoft is also like a big player in mobile, and especially now in HoloLens, so we're gonna have that as well. But, uh, without further ado, again, Wojtek, take it over. Okay, so, thanks a lot. My name is Wojtek Koszek, and uh, I'm going to present 
uh, my work on uh, project which we have mentioned about, which is Sensorama. Uh, and just a clearance, everything what I say here is basically done in my private time, it's, this is my private opinion, and uh, nothing that I've done here is represents my employer. So if you have an access to Wi-Fi right now, you can go and check it out. The project is fully open source. The, uh, the website is as you can uh, see here. Uh, and as I talk, if you have a barcode scanner, you can take a look at the website. Uh, you can snap a photo and take a look at it later. Uh, you can also install the app on Apple Store. The first version of the app has been pushed uh, quite some time ago. So you have a chance to actually, uh, you know, go home and take slides and uh, download it and play with the app a bit more and see uh, what, what the talk is all about. <coughs> so just a quick uh, like Q&A to you guys. Uh, I think mo we already had that who is uh, iOS, who is Android, so I will skip that. Uh, how many of you use open source, consciously on, or unconsciously? So we have pretty much, pretty much everybody. Now, how many of you contributed to open source? Any kind of uh, bug report, documentation fix, patch, anything? Yeah, I mean, pretty much everybody here. Uh, how many of you submitted an app to the Google Play or App Store? Okay, also like three people. And how many of you actually try to publish this app in a way like, you know, either a source code or a module of the app or the documentation? Three people. Okay, so my agenda for today is basically, it has six parts and uh, we can talk about it, uh, you know, we can, I can answer your questions and we can have a discussion in the middle of a talk as well. It's okay for me, for you to interrupt and you know tell me what you think about the certain sections of the presentation. And uh, when Suyash uh, initially in, uh, invited me, it was uh, pretty interesting that he said that uh, some of you guys already did Android uh, because my app is uh, iOS. Uh, but I will tell you my story with my app Sensorama. Uh, there is also a small episode with Android as well. And uh, it was pretty cool to uh, learn that uh, some of you are not only developers, but also uh, designers. Uh, because Sensorama was my first exposure to like a full uh, stack development. And by full stack, I mean, I did uh, design, I did implementation, I did a bit of backend, and then I tried to glue it all together in one uh, project. So as you can see, I have uh, six points and uh, First three of them are more targeted towards uh, designers or you know people who would like to get their hands dirty with design or maybe are afraid of design and don't know where to start. I uh, was in the same boat for quite some time. I was interested in design. I didn't know which tools to use, how to do it, how to you know approach problem of like designing an icon, designing a logo, uh, making a bit of graphics on the on the website so that it doesn't look too blank. Uh, and then I moved to something that is a bit more of my territory, which is you know, writing code, building a product, uh, releasing it to the customers, debugging as I go, trying to keep it maintained, uh, keeping the uh, code uh, as high quality as I can. So if you're interested in developing, this will be the, the you know, three last points of the presentation. And uh, I hope that this talk will convince you that you know, open source is uh, pretty cool and you can do interesting stuff with it and maybe some of you will leave this presentation you know, motivated and uh, you know, we hope that uh, you can get your hands dirty with open source and do some positive contributions. So a bit of my, uh, you know, about uh, my background, I actually started as a, uh, as a uh, developer who was not uh, tied to any mobile platform whatsoever. I started as a Unix developer. I actually worked for an embedded system software company. I programmed very low level software uh, running on ARM microcontrollers. And then it was not, all, not enough for me. I started to dig deeper and deeper and uh, I realized that uh, you know, designing uh, real world product is pretty cool because I had this interest in designs and uh, usability and doing usability tests with users and uh, this is where I moved, uh, moved uh, ahead. Uh, in the past, I, as Suyash mentioned, I was a FreeBSD contributor. I, I ran FreeBSD on some of my computers. 
Previously, it's in case you don't know, it's like a free open, open source operating system. If you check it out, it's great for appliances and servers and embedded systems. And uh, it, uh, it is powered by the, the powerful kernel, which has been around for years and years. Uh, so I would say my background was mostly like systems work. Uh, and I moved to apps because uh, it's very popular. It's uh, nice because it's very customer facing and it gives you a bit more space to where you can move uh, in terms of like your interests. So let's talk about uh, motivation. Like why would anyone want to spend his free time and do something that is potentially unpaid and won't make you rich and won't bring you money and uh, you know, why, why would you want to do it? So my idea at least was that for Sensorama is that I would try to build something uh, bigger and something that you know more interested people can use. And I targeted this space of data science because it has been very popular recently and more and more people say that you know if you are just a developer it won't be enough in the future you will deal with a lot of data you, people will want you to apply uh, intelligent algorithms to this data. So I started to think about okay what kind of a data set could I take so that it's not like you know boring and something that I could basically use and say that, okay, this is my own thing and I can maybe do some exploration on the things that are tied to myself. And I came up with this idea that everybody has a phone nowadays and uh, both Android and iOS phones have, uh, Android and uh, iOS phones uh, have the, a lot of sensors on them. And by sensors, I mean, whatever that you can consider as a, you know, analog to the to digital converter uh, that has an API uh, on the phone, I would say this is a sensor to me. So for example, if you take your phone and you shake it, it has an accelerometer which can detect the motion. It has a magnetometer which can detect the magnetic field and is able to tell you, you know, north, south, etc. Uh, you may have a, a whole bunch of other sensors like speedometer and uh, the proximity sensor, the, ro rotate the um, position sensor is your phone, you know, lying face down or is it facing face up? Do you hold your phone like this or do you hold your phone like that? So I found, hmm, that's pretty cool because uh, we all wear these Fitbits but they kind of break sometimes and uh, our phones don't break. So I was like, okay, why not use just the phone? And I realized that it would be cool to make apps more contextual. Uh, like if you walk in the loud environment, why do I have to deal with adjusting the volume or if I run, maybe I could have something that would adjust the rhythm of the music that uh, is being played. And I realized that for this, I will have to have some platform where I can do this exploration. And Sensorama is one of these uh, results of this exploration and this like, creative process. So the idea for Sensorama is that I could capture this data basically and do something with it. So basically data science research. Uh, and it's cool to be able to deal with your own data. And you also, when you want to design an uh, app and do the artwork and do the website and do a bit of a backend and, you know, have all these things that commercial apps have, you start to realize that you are kind of more like a product manager, no longer like a developer. You don't deal only with the code, you deal with much uh, wider spectrum of problems. Uh, also wanted to get my hands dirty of what users think, you know, how to uh, deal with people who don't understand how your app works and etc etc and this is also like a real world app so basically I didn't want to take too many shortcuts like anybody can design an app that is very simple like if you consider as many constraints as possible you make everything static you make you know there is no data model uh, there is limited UI and this app is not very comparable to what we you know, install from apps like I don't know, Uber or Lyft or like some other you know, pretty good apps. Uh, I think the app design is pretty simple, but if you want to make it a bit more real world, like a lot of problems apply. Like how to have your users authenticated and, and things like that. So this was like one of the motivations as well to get a bit more experience. And it was very different to what I used to do. Uh, so this was fun part too. And open source development. So everything what you, I will talk about is basically if you go to GitHub and you will see like hundreds of commits and 
issues and root comments about me being upset at 2 a.m. at night because some stuff didn't work and I was upset and I tried to like fix it forcibly. Uh, this is what you will see more or less how like open source development looks like. Uh, so once again, you can go to GitHub and check it out. And one thing that I would like to emphasize is that actually uh, doing open source development is really great because when you work in a bigger company, all of these modules that you get are basically like come from uh, people who you might not have noticed or you, have, you didn't know them. The components are well tested, so maybe there is a little pro number of problems that you have. Uh, very often you have the guy who wrote the code, so you can just go and ask him uh, and things like that. So open service is slightly different, you have volunteers. People who didn't get paid to do stuff, didn't you know, get any benefits from writing the code. Uh, so may, they may not even have time. Maybe they left the project that they would like to de depend on. Uh, there is nobody to ask. And sometimes you have to just figure things out by yourself. Uh, and in my opinion, this project-based learning is a great way to like, get a bit more experience. So typically when I want to learn something, I just, uh, you know, one approach is to go try to read a book and you know, by the page 200, you forgot what the pages from 0 to 100 were about, and you just don't assimilate this knowledge as much as uh, when you do when you build the product. So it's much better, in my opinion, to pick even the most simple use case you can think of, like, I don't know, to do app or to voice recorder or whatever, and just try to do it by yourself with open source modules, because you actually learn a lot. Uh, and it's funny because this app is like very simple. Like when I started to think about it a couple of months ago, it was like, okay, this app is pretty simple. It will just take you know maybe three, four weeks. Uh, and I was you know just like with any software project, this original estimate is nowhere near what the end result was. So it went from zero to basically submitting the app to uh, to the app store. And let's move to this design part. So you know what the design was and what the app concept initially was. So the general idea was sensor uh, recorder. So just like you see in a typical apps, one button, you press, it starts recording, you press once again, it stops. You get some sort of a result. In my case, it's a file, uh, and you want to do something with this file. So yeah, tap to start recording, tap to stop. And also, I wanted to easily export this data. I didn't want users to fiddle with, like, you know, weird uh, ecosystems, like specific ways of exporting file, like, you know, Apple has AirDrop, I mean, Android, I didn't even know what they have. So if you want to do it nicely, I, you, you try to like make it as simple as possible. So in my case, it's really trivial. User records file and gets the file from the email. The first screen in the app is basically you log in with your, with your email and whichever email you pick, this email will be used for you to get the recorded uh, data back. And I wanted to have open data format so that anybody uh, and can go and like read this file. I didn't want any proprietary stuff. I, everything what I used was open source, so I was like, okay, everything what I will <coughs> produce will be open source too, including the data files. And my format is JSON. And in early experiments, it was pretty clear that uh, the files are too big. Based on how uh, frequently you want to sample certain sensors, let's say you sample you know, one, uh, one, uh, four times a second, you get four samples per, um, per second. Uh, this is pretty, this sounds pretty low, like pretty small speed, pretty small sampling. But when you realize that there is maybe like five or seven or ten sensors, it starts to add up. So on top of JSON, I decided to compress the file. So why the compression I use is BZ2, which in initial experiments, it was nice uh, trade-off between speed of compression and uh, the size that you get out of the, of the app. So I watched a couple of uh, presentations about how people approach design problems, and uh, a lot of guys said that uh, the best way to design well uh, usable app is to actually look how other usable apps look like. So basically, you go and you try to use this concept, you know, good artists borrow great artists steal, and you just try to make your app as similar as possible to what users already know. 
And most of the time, when you think about it, unless your idea is you know, somewhere out there in space, what you think about is something that uh, probably has similar usability patterns. So in my case, you know, I could think about, okay, I want to start recording and stop recording. My initial thought was, okay, let's look at the uh, activity trackers, like, you know, motion apps, etc., etc. It wasn't quite there because this is not exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted the user to be more like interactive with this app. I wanted him to trigger this action, not always uh, have it, uh, you know, running in the background. So I looked at a couple of similar apps. And uh, one of the apps that I use, and it's pretty, you know, self-explanatory, is basically a voice recorder app on iOS. So literally one, uh, one, one button and, uh, and that's it. Another app, you don't kind of see it, but there is a border of like an app here. Uh, it's called uh, Apple Voice Memos. It's actually an app written by Apple. For some reason, they don't include it in the uh, default iOS distribution, so you have to go to Apple uh, Store and just search uh, Apple Voice Memos, and you will get this app. It, actually, it's kind of cool. I played rounds, and this app can detect the rhythm, and if you whistle or you play the instrument such as guitar or piano, it can actually tell you the, the, the octave and scales and everything, so it can actually detect the pitch of the, of the sound. I thought, I thought it's pretty cool. But anyway, I concentrated mostly on the, on the uh, interface. So one button and you basically start sampling, you, I think the top ones again to stop. And another thing I wanted to have is basically once I record, I wanted to have a um, listing of the samples, like the file that I recorded, I wanted to have it show up in the menu. Uh, and for this, you basically use something that is called table view. So we probably see, has, have seen this already. Whichever app basically you open, it, it already has it. Uh, so for example, this is a table view, this is, these are rows. Uh, and in my case, I basically wanted to make a, you know, one row, one file. And I like the, this is the, the clock app on iOS because it's very simple and uh, pure design. And they don't use any fancy graphics there. It's all default. Uh, elements of the UI and similar uh, worldwide, w uh, worldwide developer conference is also something that you can install from the Apple Store. So just a bit of searching on Apple Store gives you a bit more uh, motivation and inspiration on how your stuff may look like. Uh, and podcast app, same, same, same thing. Actually, because previous colors didn't work well, uh, too well on the projector, here you can see something that my app is inspired by. So. I have like a more fancy light color here, and I have inactive tabs that I grayed out, and I have some table view. So yeah, I decided to use three screens for what I wanted. So this is my first screen. Uh, this is actually during recording. If you have seen this app uh, not, not activated, it would be like, you would have a circle here, you tap, the square shows up, and then if you don't record anything, this is empty. Actually what you see here, it's like a special plugin that you know, is also open source module that ties uh, itself to the controller of this whole like table view. And if it doesn't detect the file, it you know, informs you and tells the user what's going on here. And here you have the setting screen. So basically also a table view with a couple of uh, switches. If you scroll down, you'll see a bit more developer options as well. So pretty simple. And early prototypes uh, I've done on the paper. I realized that using some like digital tools for prototyping makes little sense. The reason why is that uh, you keep iterating very often. So when I first showed uh, the app design to my girlfriend, she was uh, slightly confused and uh, she didn't know what's going on. Uh, so I decided to redo it and uh, you know I did I think like three iterations of like simple sticky note you know with circles and squares as UI elements and basically then I asked her you know what she thinks about certain uh, UI patterns and once I saw that she's able to record uh, simple stuff 
by just tweaking the you know, the sticky cards of the UI prototype, I realized that okay, I'm getting somewhere. Uh, yeah, it's pretty cool. You don't need to do much. You just uh, as you as you test the app, uh, you can actually redo the drawings. You just take another sticky node. You just draw a couple of rectangles, and you have you know newly designed uh, app concept. And a bit more about picking tools. Uh, so when you do open source, I feel like the, by default, I try to think about uh, how to make flow reproducible. Because when I think about proprietary tools uh, and proprietary uh, products, I feel like you know someone from that IT department will try to make your product and project compile. They will deliver you compilers. They will give you tools. They will give you scripts. Everything will be prepared for you. However, in open source, it's quite likely that you will have, on the other side, your basically consumers will be people who will you know, clone the GitHub project, the source code will be uh, documented as you do it, or if you do it, and they will have to get themselves bootstrap with tools, with tool chain, with you know, all the programs that are necessary, and then they will have to try to build it. So one of the things that you may want to think about when you work on open source is that when you pick a tool, it would be nice to have the tool that is easy to automate and that is easy to run in a batch mode. And the funny part is that uh, while tools for developers are designed that way by default, tools for designers for some reason are not. And I think it's, uh, you know, designers they are basically visual people, they have to see what's going on. Uh, and I think the exporting and like uh, you know showing the end result to the user is like the very last step of their process. So few tools have that capability of actually being like scriptable. So I started from Inkspace, uh, which was free. Uh, I started the app design actually on Android. The first version of the app was not uh, iOS. The reason why I picked Android is because uh, a friend of mine who was interested in the app told me that he's an Android phone. Um, so, you know, this idea of like collaborative development would be much easier and nicer. So I started to use Inkscape for like sketching how the app could finally look like, how the UI could look like. Uh, but the problem is that when you pick the tool for design, you will quickly realize that things that you would like to have, such as uh, skeletons of the, of the UI elements and stencils and uh, you know, ready to use button, uh, rectangles that you would like to just co copy and paste in. If you don't have an ecosystem for that, I mean, nobody will do it for you. So it's like a lot of added work. And even though that I like the idea of using open source products for open source development, I just uh, gave up. Uh, I think there is just not enough ecosystem yet for like free open source uh, design tools. So yeah, I switched to something else. Um, so yeah, I had to like swallow the bullet and just decide to spend some money to get something decent that would uh, make me a bit more productive. Uh, and it's quite likely that some of the tools you already have. Uh, so first of all, first one is Keynote. It's uh, quite funny to think about it, but Keynote is actually quite a powerful uh, design tool. It's not only a you know slides and presentation uh, program. It's also like thing that basically gives you an ability to quickly draw rectangles on the screen. And funny, some people actually publish the stencils and templates of things that you can download and uh, use. Uh, I saw this great presentation by Apple guys. Uh, it's called Take, Take It Till You Make It. What, the, what they show there is they take a abstract concept for an app that they just quickly came up with and they show how they can uh, use Keynote for prototyping. And the funny part is that I would never believe that you can just take a slide uh, program and make the UI actually be fairly interactive and you can actually see what's going on. Uh, so I thought it's pretty cool and it's free if you have a Mac. Uh, so it was pretty pretty nice. You can you can check it out. It's pretty pretty interesting presentation. And there was a follow-up. They did the same for hardware, which was super cool, which uh, the, apparently they do. They use this methodology of, of prototypes, like not working, uh, not not the working hardware, no hardware prototype, just prototype hardware in a software and uh, understand if users like it. 
So even other presentation that I can recommend is pretty interesting. So if you don't have Keynote, PowerPoint, I'm pretty sure has the same capability. So you can give it a shot. Uh, and software I paid for, uh, first I decided to use Affinity Designer. Uh, this is like a tool that tries to be a competitor for Adobe Illustrator. Um, it's nice because it has a flat rate, single uh, pricing, so you pay $50 once and you have it forever. I don't know if they will like, keep it like this, but for now it is like that. Uh, they keep winning a lot of like Apple Design Awards. This tool is pretty nice. Um, but it has no, uh, not, not, not enough community, and it's very promising. Uh, yeah, it's not very expensive compared to like Adobe Creative Suite, uh, but it has no scripting, so it kind of killed me because the thing that I wanted to do is basically once I, I, I knew upfront that when I design like icon, for example, and you want to have it exported in the uh, modern app, uh, like you know on iOS or Android. The Android Studio and Xcode have this, recommend, uh, have this requirement that you must export the artwork in like three or four resolutions. And you do it for a lot of devices. So you, you, if you don't automate it, I mean, it, it must be a lot of work. Uh, so I wanted to have my generation of my artwork uh, automated. And I think this was one of the good decisions that I did this whole like walk through the tools and picked something that actually worked. Uh, otherwise, it would be a lot of uh, unnecessary time spent. I took a look at this tool graphic. It used to be called iDraw. Uh, iDraw was like an independent company. They got bought by Autodesk. Autodesk renamed this program. The, the website is still around, so if you run this program, you can go and check it out. Uh, it's nice and simple, and uh, it has a uh, scripting, but it's really weird. It's kind of like a JavaScript blended with uh, Objective-C. Uh, it's hard to find documentation and examples for that. Uh, I tried to write a plugin for exporting, but I, I gave up. It's, it was too, too hard to debug, basically. It provides very little debuggability, so I didn't like it. Uh, and also no real ecosystem. So while they show some fancy graphics on the website, there I didn't see any uh, app developers using that. So software I can recommend is uh, Adobe Creative Suite. Everybody's using that. Uh, the problem is that it's, to me, it's really expensive. I use the design tool maybe you know, once a month or twice a month or you know, a couple of times a week. And it's not often enough to justify $50 a month. The nice thing is that uh, you know, people who are in the creative field love it because in the past we had to like spend like three thousand dollars on the whole thing and you didn't get updates you had to pay for updates separately so this pricing per month is actually very nice for them you don't have to like invest upfront a lot of money you can you know use it for three months and resign from the membership but for me it was just too much hassle uh, the nice thing about this is that they give you like all possible tools there that you may need so and it's all like interoperable within the creative suite but I stuck to Sketch. Uh, it, it's very popular recently. It's also easy. It's flat rate pricing, so you pay also fifty dollars once. Uh, a lot of the designers use it. There is a lot of stencils and templates that you may want to check it out. Uh, you just uh, go and copy paste, and you can prototype really quickly with it. So a lot of people just publish, you know, something like iOS ten. Uh, stencils and you basically get a file which you can open in Sketch and it has all possible uh, UI elements that Xcode will natively give you and you can just uh, you know wire them together you stitch them together to make screens uh, which is really cool because you know when you it, there is no necessity to do it by yourself all, all other people did it for you so there is no real uh, benefit in re reinventing the wheel and the nice thing about it that I really like is that it has some decent usable scripting. So it was a winner for me. Uh, the tool that I uh, mentioned uh, in terms of the command line is uh, called Sketch Tool. They support it. You download it from the website. It gets installed on the Mac uh, in no time. I think uh, Homebrew, the, the package manager on uh, Mac, uh, has, it, has this tool already. So you can uh, like, install it right away. 
Uh, Scratch is also in homebrew. Uh, if you know homebrew is like a package manager for Mac, it has uh, open source modules, but it has also something that is called Cask, which is like an additional functionality uh, that lets you to inst lets you install binary commercial software in the command line. So like it's literally two commands to get it to work. And you can also find a lot of uh, tutorials how other guys use it. So I decided that my artwork will be one uh, sketch file. Uh, and also artwork is open source. So if you go, want to go and check it out, it's, it's here. This is the link to the repository. And uh, you will see how it's all structured. Uh, okay, so this is how it all looks like. So this is the app icon that I designed. Uh, this is the main view of Sketch. Uh, now, I haven't done much research into actually how to like properly uh, structure your project according to the methodology. So I basically kept trying till things worked the way I wanted. So the way I structured it is I found it's probably also like unsupported side effect of something that someone didn't notice is that I, I, I figured out that if you like name your pages with slashes and uh, according to like certain uh, file naming scheme, the exporting will actually accept this whole thing like fully and it will create directories for you and it will create files with the prefix that you can see here and uh, it turned out that it was really cool. So basically I have my icon uh, designed once. This is, these are the elements that you can see. And for all the uh, outputs that I want, so I wanted to have iOS output, I wanted to have web output, I wanted to have Android output. Each of these outputs has like separate set of settings that you have to have. And thanks to that, I can actually uh, have my project generate everything at once. Uh, so yeah, this is the thing that you can see a bit more clearer. You have like full paths, etc., etc. And you can see how many uh, files the Xcode requires. So you have to have some uh, in in uh, Xcode. The the artwork is called uh, assets. So you have everything grouped in a file called assets. And this file uh, assets has certain types of like uh, artwork that you can have. One of them is the icon that you will use on Apple Store, and it's completely different resolution than other, any other icon. You must have an app icon, which will be what you tap on the front screen when your app starts. And you have to have a launch screen. This is the screen that after you tap, it will show up, and while your app is crunching some stuff in the background and starting up, you will, you will be able to see it. And I wanted to have a you know, web uh, icon that I can put on the website as well. And as I said, I started from Android, so Android has yet another set of requirements. They name it by, you know, I think like something like HD, HD, Super HD, you know, Extra Large, Super HD, Super Extra Large. So there is like a lot of settings. And the way I came up with it is that uh, also like, I don't, I'm not sure if it's correct or not, but the way I figured it out is that, okay, all the resolutions that I want, are slightly weird. The only thing that uh, kind of you know relates them with each other is that it's a square. Uh, so I pick, I figured out that I will just pick easy to multiply values. So I pick 100 by 100 points, and whatever multiplier I needed, I just stick it in here. And here I make it be named in a certain way, the way I want, so that the files generated will you know uh, be in a format that I understand. Uh, and that's it, and th this is very nice, so, because, you know, I just pick easy to understand the number and the files ge are generated exactly the way I need. And uh, if you go to this repository that I showed, you will see that the artwork is basically generated uh, with one command. I have a command called re regen, it uh, takes the sketch file, it takes the sketch tool, it runs the file with the, against the tool, and I get all the things uh, spit it out in the correct locations. And then I have another uh, update script, which basically takes all my uh, files and uh, it copies it in uh, my app directory. Um, and then I can just commit it. So if I want to regenerate an artwork, it's literally 
You go to the tool, you edit, you do the commands, and it's done. So if anyone uh, deal, de deals with this problem, if you have any hardware, you can let me know how it works for you. And uh, it would be great because to me it was like a unknown territory and the way I figured it out is like it works for me, but I, 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 it's hard for me to imagine that other people do it that way because uh, you know my app is like literally one, or one uh, icon for the branding and a couple of icons for the buttons. I feel like other people probably have better ways to do it. I have a related question. Um, what kind of uh, vector formats are possible against SVG? Yeah, so actually this is a good good, good, uh, good uh, note. So Xcode, I think, and people from Apple recognize that this is a problem. Like they keep adding devices and it appears that the trend is that, you know, we'll have more pixels on the screen. And this app, this, uh, a lot of people complain that it takes a lot of time to regenerate all these uh, asset files. So the newest Xcode has this feature where if you export the file into the PDF format, uh, you can actually tell Xcode to use the PDF and it will do all these exporting in the current resolutions, like all these resolutions for you. However, when I went and I read the forums, people were upset because there